Welcome back to Unfazed Under Fire. I'm David Craig Us, the leadership alchemist, the host for this show and your guide on a journey to leadership mastery. This show is dedicated to helping executives like you enhance your leadership impact, not just by refining your strategies, but by transforming the very essence of how leadership is understood and practiced to ensure you're always on the cutting edge. Here we challenge conventional wisdom, exploring breakthroughs in the development of leadership and organizational culture. We aim to give you insights that resonate deeply with the challenges and opportunities you face in the executive suite. We believe that in creating workplaces that are not only productive, but also uplifting, where your people can be inspired to give their best in service to your organization's mission and key priorities. Our approach is grounded in the reality that true leadership begins from within. Whether you're aware of it or not, the truth is that every human being possesses the resourcefulness needed to overcome the most daunting challenges. And this resourcefulness is accessed through the journey of self-mastery. Such self-mastery lays the foundation for leading others with clarity, purpose, and grace. Today, leadership can, be, can quickly become confusing and frustrating without such mastery and a connection to one's inner compass because of the turbulence and uncertainty we're facing in the world today. So whether or not you're here to sharpen your leadership skills, gain fresh perspectives, or simply want to find a community of like-minded leaders, leaders Unfazed Under Fire is your place for growth, inspiration, and transformation. And today I'm thrilled to add to our esteemed list of guests. With me is Karen DeMichaelis, CFO of Superstores Industry. Karen, welcome to the show. Thank you for here. Great. Now I'm going to say a little bit about you, just give uh, our listeners some flavor of who you are, which is a pretty robust background. Uh, Karen is a visionary CFO and CEO advisor with over 25 years of experience driving transformation change across diverse industries. Currently, she's serving as chief financial officer at Superstore Industries, where she oversees the financial strategy and operational leadership of $1.2 billion joint venture between Northern California's largest grocery retailers. Her ability to lead high stakes mergers and acquisitions coupled with her innovation or innovative approach to financial planning and analysis has consistently delivered sustainable growth and operation, operational excellence every company she's been a part of. Beyond her corporate accomplishments, Karen is also a dedicated educator with over two decades of experience as an adjunct faculty member where she has shaped the minds of future business leaders. She's a true pioneer in her field and she has successfully integrated AI technology into business processes to enhance transparency and efficiency. Karen's commitment to fostering transparency, integrity, and accountability is a testament to her holistic approach as a leader. And I'm thrilled to have her on the show today and to have her share her insights and experiences. She currently lives in Escalon, California, a small farming community just east of San Francisco, and in her spare time enjoys riding bikes around the beautiful area there. So Karen, I trust I got that right. Is there anything else that you'd add? No, I, I think you you nailed it. I appreciate that. Thank you. Great. Well, you know, I, I, I remember on our design call for the podcast, you shared about your career journey that started far away from finance. So I'd love, because I, I always love to hear people's stories because it always doesn't start where it currently is, right? That's just the nature of life. So I'd love you if you could talk to you a little bit about, you know, your, your early education and how that evolved to you now becoming a, such a successful CFO. So, so David, I'm probably your typical <laughs> college student that every parent fears they will get, you know, changing <laughs> majors every, uh, every semester based upon whatever was easiest or most uh, inspiring at that moment. Um, so I went to Santa Clara University, um, and while there, I became an English major. I finally had to settle into a major my junior year. So I became an English major, and I was studying Chaucer and Milton, all very useful topics. It's not like I was doing technical <laughs> writing or something functional. Um, doing a lot of poetry. Um, I learned uh, guitar, Renaissance guitar. Um, and, and remember, you know, as I was going through all of this, you know, I was great for the coffee, the emerging coffee, coffee uh, shop culture, um, but not mm -hmm. so much with the campfire crowd and certainly not with um, potential um, income. Um, and my parents were starting to feel a little concerned. Um, 
I, they knew I didn't want to be a teacher. Mom was a retired teacher. Uh, she had put in 50 years finally when she did retire. Dad was a farmer and he knew I wasn't going to be a farmer. My roommate said, hey, Karen, why don't you come take the GMAT with me? Um, and this is in the days before you had to pre-register. And I said, sure, why not? One of many sure, why not moments in my life. And uh, <laughs> so that, that started it. So I went, I took the GMAT. I ended up being having outreach to me by the um, Agribusiness Institute. Now I think it's, I believe it's the uh, uh, Food and Beverage Innovation Center, but it was a, a subset of the Santa Clara MBA program, which was focused on agribusiness studies and policy. Um, so I found myself that very first semester taking graduate level calculus and intermediate algebra concurrently because I needed to have a passing grade in algebra so that I could pass. Uh, that I could complete my coursework. Um, and keep in mind, I was an English major, you know, studying, you know, very Englishy type of material. And the only math class I had was math without fear for English majors um, at the community <laughs> college level. So I adapted. And, you know, as we talk about this, you'll hear me talk a lot about, you know, adaptability and, and being able to, um, to, to respond with the moment. Um, and so this was the first of many uh, major adaptations around my career uh, was uh, just a spontaneous moment. You know, let's go take the GMAT. And, and there I am. That's great. And here you are today. Uh, and then you've had quite a career in finance. You've, you've crossed many kind of different kinds of businesses uh, mm -hmm. from being a finance manager at PepsiCo to now being part CFO of this joint venture that you're involved in. How would you say is that kind of tapestry work together to make you, you know, to form your financial leadership today? How how would you describe that? How that all came together? Yeah, there, you know, there's been some consistency in my career. As a friend once said, Karen, you've spent a lot of time putting liquid into containers, um, and. <laughs> And I, I think whether it's oil and gas or, um, you know, consumer products, um, th there's some truth to that. Um, but as I think about the skills that I take, whether it was in, you know, you heard me talk a little bit about adapt adaptability, is that ability to, um, the three things that stand out to me in, in my career is being the adaptable being resilient and being authentic and um, adaptable. We've talked a little bit, you know, it's just being open-minded, curious, and flexible. It's um, yeah. having some yeah. of those, those sure, why not moments. And I don't mean to make that sound lackadaisical, but it's more like, let me try that. Let me experiment with yeah. that. Let me s see how that fits. You know, maybe that's the right path. Um, resilience is is that ability to sustain under pressure and cope with disruption and, and friction. You know, we all have that. You know, is that you hit a wall? Are you going to like turn around and go the other direction, or are you going to figure out how you're going to get around that wall? And and that ties back to the adaptability. And the third area that I think has been very critical to my career um, path, and and it's transcended everything, is authenticity. Um, and I haven't been 100% authentic over my life span. I don't know anyone who has because there's yes. been, you know, interruptions there. Um, but when I am authentic, when I am most comfortable with myself is when I do best. When yes. I am most comfortable with myself, that's when I'm most able to lift other people. Um you know, and, and we all have those inauthentic moments that shape us and, and we're not at our best, whether it's divorce, maybe it's a, a transition out of a job that's a little bit bumpy. Um, you know, yeah. life happens, right? But but as long as we come back to our core and we stay authentic to our true selves, um, and then you blend that with adaptability and resilience, it, I think that for me, that's been been the 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 magic beans the 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 recipe for my success and those are the yeah, essential skills that really help me yeah i love that i mean to me the whole description of of the path to authenticity is a pathway we come in we come into our 20s right and we we we, we tend to wear super 
uh, woman or Superman suits at that time, like we could do anything. And then we get hit a couple of times by life. And then we start saying, maybe I have to act differently to get what I need. And then that doesn't work. And then we come back. Eventually, we do come back to ourselves. When we come back to ourselves, that's when everything does work better. And and as you as you get the flavor of that, you know when you've been able, then you start knowing when you're away from it. That, that didn't feel right. How do I get back to that place when I felt whole and in myself? And also all those kicks in the gut and those changes and everything, you either get you either get to a place where you say yes, or you start being reserved and cautious and saying no. And you realize, as I realized in my own life, you know, I got into a habit at one point in my life where I say, nah, not that. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. Things would come to me and I wasn't saying yes. And I, that was a really uh, alerting moment for me because I got behind the eight ball in my business because I wasn't saying yes, because I thought some of the work that was coming to me was, quote, unquote, below me. That was my arrogance at the time. And uh, now I've, I've learned from that. <laughs> and now I say yes a lot more because as long as it's inconsistent with what I want, I'm here to do. And then also having those experiences of resilience are so important, especially today. I mean, we're getting kicked in the gut every day with things that are happening in the world. And we just have to keep on leaning into what can I do about it? How can I have impact? Where can I step in and, and make a difference? Right. It's very beautiful. Mm -hmm. And you've also been... Um, a teacher for many, many years at adjunct faculty at a number of different universities uh, systems and and teaching various business courses. And, you know, what drew you to doing that? And how has that experience as an educator supported you in your approach to leading others? Just curious. Yeah. So, you know, I started off saying I, I didn't want to be a teacher, right? Um, and, <laughs> and that is true. It wasn't intentional. Again, I get back to, sure, why not moment. Um, Back in around 2000, 2001, University of Phoenix was really exploding with growth. And they they were looking mm -hmm. for adjunct faculty to come in and help deliver their, their faculty practitioner model. And I was up in Alaska. I had the two, the girls were little at that point in time. Um, I, I was what they call a slope widow. My, my husband at that time was a slope worker up in the uh, North Slope oil field. So I had a lot of time where I was a single parent, I, you know, and the girls are sleeping, so I have something to do. Um, at that time, that came across. I thought, well, let me try that. That sounds like it might be interesting. I've been doing a little bit of something similar with um, Parent Soup, a, a sub subsidiary of iVillage with their asynchronous environment for, for fam families. Um, so I jumped into to the teaching and I started teaching a graduate level accounting because that's where they had a high need. And um, mm -hmm. again, here's the English major teaching graduate level accounting. So <laughs> it was a fun experience. It's funny, isn't it? <laughs> um, and, yeah. and so that's how I got into it. And then shortly thereafter, um, I'm going to say University of Arizona Global, but at that point in time, it was um, Ashford University, um, who was then bought by Bridgeport. You know how acquisitions go. And uh, yeah. So I picked those them up in, in 2010. And so between those two schools, I'm teaching either graduate or undergraduate finance and accounting coursework, a lot of business ethics these days, um, some business writing. Uh, again, part of this whole experience is, again, coming back and storytelling and how, how do you take in this flat, asynchronous in, environment where you don't have a visual with students, where you're making that online connection you're building that bridge of community and you're teaching them or answering questions, helping them to understand some really dry and interesting topics. You know, I mean, debits and credits are only so exciting. So, you know, <laughs> it's being true. able to bring forward the storytelling and do so in a manner that people can connect in, in that flat environment. So that's kind of the long yeah, story there. Yeah. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah, so it's it's how do you is that the translation is how do you get people engaged at work in maybe tasks that are, are monotonous or they have to do every day or whatever mm -hmm. and keep them motivated and engaged. So you probably learned something there, right? How to do that and how, how, as as you look at your broader leadership brand, how how would you define how you want to be known or are known as a leader and kind of what principles of leadership do you stand on and say these are my go to if I'm if I'm caught back on my heels, if something's happening, if I have a moment I have to engage resiliency, what do you go to to stand on to regroup and step in or generally lead in an organization that you're in? 
Um, you know, at the end of the day, it comes back to the people, right? It's all mm -hmm. about the people. And so when I'm, I'm faced with a task, it, the, it's very easy to turn on the analytical side of my brain um, and go to the numbers and bury myself in the spreadsheet. But it's the people part, that connection. You know, reading a lot of literature, I still read a lot of literature, it, you're, you're learning about people, about things, about relationships, and, and it does come back to the people, right? Because the spreadsheet aside, the numbers aside, you have to figure out how to meet the people where they are and how to work with the people, again, being the authentic person. And, um, you know, as I was preparing for this, this discussion and, and thinking about some of these questions, you know, and, and trying to think, what, it, what, how would I define my brand? And, you know, I think I might come up with a statement kind of like, um, you know, a passion for creating an environment um, that fosters the human connection, embraces technology, because you'll hear me talk about AI, which is just really exciting to me and all the different iterations of it, um, in technology in general. And and how to inspire opportunities, not just for myself, but for other people. Because again, together we rise, right? So yeah. so how do I create an environment that I thrive in and that others I can help others thrive in? And so so that's kind of how I would de define my philosophy for leading not just finance, but in general. Yeah, and I think, you know, that the, the, you touched on two things that I believe are the fundamental jobs of a leader is to create that environment and to facilitate conversations that forward what's most important. So you have to know how to create that environment, right, and what type of environment you're trying to create. And also you have to be able to not just have conversations to get people to do stuff, but have conversations where you're present in the conversation, genuinely listening coaching in addition to getting things to move forward and supporting that person to feel good about the job they're doing or to give them tough feedback they may need from time to time in a way that they can yeah. they can absorb it take it in and not make it take it too personally all those kinds of things that we have to do as leaders and i think you also said that you know you really are committed to in our conversation whatever really like committed to create fostering a culture of transparency integrity and accountability mm -hmm. which i think feeds into what you just said so can you share a little bit more about how your approach ensures those values of are, are unfolded around you and any specific strategies you have to, to ensure that transparency, integrity, and accountability are fostered on a daily basis? Yeah, you know, um, you know, as we, as we, we think about the, those characteristics, um, you know, I, I think there's some stories there that probably explain it best and um yeah you know, we all you know, the best. heard where you know <laughs> yeah you know i've walked into many organizations where the budgets are a secret right well finance did the budget you know it's finance's budget and it's like no it's not finance's budget finance is a tool to help you with your budget you know we're, we're just a means or a mechanism and, and it's really about what do you need to create a budget so that you can measure your own success and so to drive that accountability and, and move that re, that that onus from the finance shoulders to to the operations because we're trying to facilitate that front line right give them all the tools and and, and help them understand again we are a resource we're not a weapon to beat them down because mm -hmm. they missed the budget you know they have to own it mm -hmm. right and so you know when i think of things like that you know there's a there was an experience I had at Crystal Creamery with involving, and it's really kind of a silly story, but there was, um, I always have a whiteboard in my office wherever I'm at, and I always have just sometimes keywords on it, um, just things that, that as I pass it, just keep in front of mind. And one of the phrases was pig farmer. Um, and why that was important was, you know, I had just in talking to people, I'd heard about the pig farmer. And it's like, I was trying to understand what is the pig farmer? What does the pig farmer do? You know, we're dairy here and, and we sell milk and ice cream and cottage cheese. What is a pig farmer? And then I said, oh, we have a contract with this pig farmer and they pick up all the waste. Well, and the sidebar I'm seeing on the, we're wrestling with 
product variances, right? And, and product loss, and we're losing like a million dollars, you know, every six weeks. And it's like, why are we losing it? And we couldn't hone it down. We could tease out pieces of it, but we couldn't hone it down. And finally, the, there was a gal outside my office, an AP clerk, and she, and she would come into my office every now and then chit chat. And she would say, Karen, what's pig farmer mean? And so I told her one day and she says, hey, I want to show you this. And she showed me an invoice from the pig farmer. And it was just a blank piece of paper, had his name at the top, a dollar amount at the bottom, and signed off by, by the person handling the account. And I said, okay, first off, I said, what are we paying for? I said, you got to exactly. get more information to pay this, right? So she started hunting that down. Long story short, by the time we went from that, we discovered that we were, we thought we were, were dumping about one to two vans of product a week. We were dumping more like one to two vans a day. And in some instances, we actually, with photographs, were able to demonstrate that we were, we had overproduced like a private label. So the customer wasn't going to buy it. <clears throat> we were literally driving that truck off the van line, off the production line, over to the dump station for the pigs. Um, and so once we, we had the story pulled together and we saw all the pieces of it, starting with what this AP clerk had shared with me through this transparency. Um, we were able then to to knock off a big portion of that product loss. But again, it comes to being transparent and then starting to just be objective, have conversations, be authentic, bring people into the path, and then hold people accountable. So then we had a process in place and we started recording. And then once we were recording, we knew where we had other issues. And so it's just one thing fit on the other. But again, it all, all ties together there. Yeah, but that investigation and that transparency led to all that, you know, and I think, you know, sometimes yeah. there's a resistance to transparency. Like if people knew this information, now, honestly, obviously you have, to, you have to be cautious at certain times when you can't share, you might have to be doing layoffs, or whatever it is. You have to be careful with certain things and yeah. legal issues and all that. But, but when you're trying to solve a problem, you know. Uh, you know, I find sometimes people get in meetings and they're arguing with each other and they're actually saw, they're arguing against two different, they're, they're actually have two different problems in their mind. They're not really against each other. They're just, they just have two different problems and they don't like the solution yeah. the other person provides, which is for another problem, you know, but what, what do you think makes, what, what have you seen in your experience about how do you build that transparency? Is it just for you or through you modeling it? Uh, is it through, uh, setting clear expectations. How, how is that transparency? You know, how do you know where to, where you can be transparent first of all, and then well, how do you how do you foster that in an organization? Yeah, you know, it's it comes down to that that kind of speed of trust that you start with little things, yeah. right? And and I'm going to call a budget a little thing, right? Because normally I would say a budget is a little thing, and the those those more things you can't be as transparent with like layoffs and that kind of planning uh, occur at the higher level. I'm going to call it at the corporate level, FP&A right. um, or above. Um, but, but for those other things where you can be, you know, so really assess what, what you're doing and do you need to be that way? You know, at, at SSI, we had an issue with inventory adjustments. And when I walked in there, everyone kept saying, well, it's a source of revenue. Inventory adjustments are a source of revenue. And I'm like scratching my head thinking, no, inventory adjustments are just basically periodic true ups and should always be correcting itself, right? And and really that number is maybe a recording issue between periods. Um, but it shouldn't be a consistent revenue <laughs> generating thing because you're not growing your, your inventory yeah, organically. It's false false um, growth. And yeah, so yeah. once we start, you know, once we started peeling around that account, we had operations involved, IT involved, and then people started talking about it. We discovered it wasn't an it wasn't an account. Matter of fact, it was how they were relieving another account so that that other account wasn't as transparent about the heavy gains in it. And it's like, no, it shouldn't have those gains because we should be recognizing that those those gains as we go along, not saving them for 
when someone won't make their budget so that we have a little padding, it's like, no, we don't do that kind of math. Um, just keep it honest, keep it simple, keep it transparent. So again, picking something little, building that that trust Rusters. in those areas and then it grows and then you, then you end up with a very transparent organization people are willing to talk things out because it feels safe and and then holding yeah. people to that that standard yeah i think it's beautiful trust and safety are essential and you have to build that over time because people people all everybody has a different relationship in their consciousness with authority right and we yeah. we don't know we we can't go into their minds or they come into the organization and see where they're at with that we can only you know, watch that over time and see what they need to do to feel safe. And we have to, they have to see it. Of course they see it. Oh, wow. They, they just spoke their mind. It was direct. That's refreshing. You know, and we have to coach people around that and support them around that and building that trust up and that safety. That's really well said. Yeah. Um, you also, you also, and I think you're, you're speaking to this now, so I don't think you haven't spoken to say, but is there anything else you want to say about, like you mentioned that finance isn't just about the hard skills and numbers, but it also has a softer side on it, you know, at, at an umbrella level, how would you, what would, what would you say about that? Like, I think that's true. I mean, ultimately the numbers are meant to help decision-making, which can go towards that softer side, but what, what other, what other things would you say about that? How it's a mix of both of those uh, things? You know, the soft skills in finance, you know, I, there's been a lot written recently about how much time we're spending communicating. Right. Um, I think there was a Forbes article that said we spend like 18 percent of our, our day communicating um, in, in other situations. I think it was Deloitte who had a or HBR that had a, an, a study that it was like 88 percent that we spend communicating. Um, so when I think of it, it's, it's not just the numbers, um, but but it's the ability to tell that story to understand that story, to convey yeah. that story, to, to piece out what of the story makes sense or doesn't make sense and, and bring it all together. And that's where finance is, is able to make that contribution because we're, we're trying to not just report numbers and report KPIs, but, but understand the context for them and, and you know, then how, how we can shape that data and apply those concepts. Yeah. Because I think uh, you know, if you're looking at increasing funding, a lot of times the story, they want to know that their story is grounded, but it's a story that sells, right? It's a story that yeah. attracts that, like the excitement of what's possible here. And oh, by the way, we've done our due diligence and this is solid in this, this, and this mm -hmm. way. So the story is supported by the numbers, but the story is what sells, right? It's, a, it's the thing that, get, that gets the street, the, you know, the investors excited, et cetera. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you, you know, you, you, You've talked about uh, this whole area of of taking care of people, and I really like that. I want to kind of extrapolate on that more. And I'm wondering, you know, because I look at there is a wide range, like in any field, whether it's a CIO, CEO, uh, CMO, CL, whatever, uh, or a CFO, that has a wide range of how they attend to that. I still think for many CFOs, I don't know what the percentage would be, it's still an afterthought or, or, or given lip service. Mm -hmm. You know, what is it that you, you see in your own profession that still needs to grow and expand that would help every CFO be more successful in this area? I know it's, a, it's kind of building off something said it's not a question I gave you, but I'm just curious if you have any thoughts on that. What is the, what is the um, profession or the people at that level still have to learn and appreciate that they may not be appreciating about that, that would help it be easier for them to begin to adopt that and become ma more masterful at engaging that side of their job. Yeah, you know, one of the things that I have found particularly helpful and inspiring is, is having a leadership coach. Um, and it, it might not be one, it might be two, it might be changing over time. Um, but I think that having, having that coach that as you are, are facing situations as that safe spot, you can go where you can try on different paradigms and, mm -hmm. and, and, 
and and just talk through. I, it's just like the rearview mirror, you know, approach where you're sitting in your car and you're talking out different scenarios. But sometimes that that executive coach um, has insights um, that that really help you. They they have that business expertise, that organizational management expertise. They they've probably talked to other C suite people, so they have a concept. They they're in your mind. They can get there easily, and they can guide you and to think that you can do it all on your own or by reading a book or listening to to um, a lecture. No, you really sometimes have to have that discussion. And that's where I think that value of that executive coach um, is helpful. You know, in, in my, my situation, one of the benefits of coming to the C-suite is oftentimes that, that CHRO or that, that VPI of HR they fill, fill that function of, a, of an executive coach internally. Um, and, and that's a safe space where you can have that collaborative discussion because it, you're, you're all working together and, and they, they're able to kind of tease things out and help you. Um, but the external one also is able to bring in other insights and say, you know, I heard someone talking about this at this other company. That, that soft skills, you have to really think about how you're going to develop it. and and that that executive coach or that professional coach there's there's value in that and and I don't think people embrace that enough I wish now I had been talking to people an an executive coach type relationship you know 10 years ago um as opposed to within the past 2 years but um I think that that is a, a an important part of our toolkit that helps us with that soft skill. Because, you know, as finance people, accounting people, it's very easy to hide behind a spreadsheet, hide behind a desk, hide behind a closed door. You know, heck, as, as a, an English lit major, I like to hide in the library behind a book, you know, <laughs> uh, but we have to get out and we have to interact with people. And yeah. so just having that little executive coach sitting on the shoulder, that little inner, inner helping with that inner voice is very helpful. Is, does that yeah, answer your question? What, what have you learned from your coach that like that that about yourself that is not in your way anymore? Maybe some things that got out of your way that you recognize that uh, that 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 insights came from that relationship and those interactions. Anything you would be willing to share? Um, you know, one of the things that we're working on right now um, for me, my challenge is. I've always saw the CFO suite as as the pinnacle of my career. And and mm-hmm. now what we're shifting the focus on is why does it have to be the, the pinnacle of my career? Maybe I have yes. you know the skill set to be a CEO. You know, and if I mm-hmm. am, what does that look like? And you know, what do I bring? And I was just talking to someone yesterday and they had brought in a, a, a third person and you know, he said, you know, look, you're learning this Portuguese language so that you can take this test on proficiency. <laughs> and you're really, you know, fascinated with this culture. Um, what if you took your skill set and you went over to the European market and became a CEO for a CPG startup or type company in Portugal? And it was like, oh, my God, that would be like the perfect world, right? It would be just a perfect yeah. experience at kind of a you know, sure, why not? Let's try something like that. I think it would be exciting. Um, And, uh, but, but in my head, you know, again, there's still, I think I'm here at this journey, but, you know, maybe the journey is still further up. Um, And so that, that, that coach is able to help say, you have this skill, all this toolbox, why stop here? You know, there's a lot of CEOs who don't have that level. And and if you look Absolutely. at statistically, you're seeing more of it that a lot of these C suite the CEO roles increasingly are being filled by the CFO because we are often there as the advisor to the CEO. We have that number expertise. We've we're seeing now the whole business as opposed to being more the transactional controller type. So so we have it. It's just now how do we tap it? How do we recognize it, tap it and build it? Um, and so um, that that's the value that my coach has been bringing with me. So yeah, I mean, I, one of my clients just was was came into an organization I work with her as CFO. She's now become the CEO of the organization, and that was part of that came from 
the CEO is saying there's something you have to develop in yourself before. I already see you as a, that potential. So he, he had an eye on her right away. She had a natural instinct for things, mm -hmm. but there was something that was in her way. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm not saying it was because of me, but she, she moved through that and to the point where he said, okay, you, you've now gotten over that. Let's, 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 let's get you up. Cause I want to get the heck out of here. I want to be on the board. Mm -hmm. I got other things to do in my life. So it's like, it's, <laughs> it, it, it can, can happen. I think you're absolutely right that you know, if you have the side of the, you know, if you understand the revenue side of the business and you understand the people side of the business and you understand yeah. the finance side of the business, you know, and you understand the markets and what they need, what else do you need to be CEO? I mean, there's other things to round out, but those are the big pieces. And uh, yeah, and it's also, there's something that happens to me and when I work with clients that when I spark that greater possibility, something happens in the way they do their role now. There's something that relaxes in them, that expands. They're not as hyper-focused in certain ways. And when they relax, they actually, more that more that authenticity becomes to come through more, right? Yeah. And that frees them to be themselves, frees other people to be themselves around them more. So it's really well said, really well said. And I know that you've had a lot of impact on people. So I want to just turn another direction here. I know you've had a lot of impact on those that have reported to you over the years and, and people, this has been an evolving thing, but you, people are so important to you. You, you, you have any examples of, of that impact that you look back on and say, well, I really feel honored that I was able to affect that person's life or those individuals' lives in a way that, that forwarded their careers and allowed them to grow. Oh yeah. You know, um, sure you have multiple examples. It, yeah, no, at, at, again, this is a story at Crystal Creamery. I was having the hardest time finding uh, people to for my FP&A department. And people, um, you know, I could hire analysts, but they all had a vision of, of what they wanted to do. Um, and it wasn't necessarily aligned with, with the needs of the business um, or with my vision, you know. And, and, you know, let's face it, it is a bit of a, a dictatorship in corporations, you know, <laughs> so, um, but, you know, we can make it as soft as we want, but again, you can't be, you know, down on the front line, making your own direction, right? You, you do have to get with the team, follow the team, team spirit. Um, and, but I was having a hard time. I tried it, you know, at a financial analyst level, I tried at the senior level, tried at the manager. I just couldn't find people. I found a lot who wanted to quiet quit, a lot who had their own vision, um, a lot who had a, a different perception of their skills than they actually did. And having come from fp and I, I have an idea of what's involved in that. So um, I, I was just kind of beside myself and, and the VPHR, Walter, um, and I sat down one day and I said, Walter, I said, you know, I bet I could go to Stanislaus State uh, down the road here. I can get three or four kids right out of graduation, the graduation line, and train them up in a year, have them fully functional and perfect employees. And he says, well, it's probably cheaper to do that than what we're doing. So that's what I did. And so I went out and, and hired four people. Um, and yeah, it was a big investment up front, but all of them just really took off. And, you know, after about, I always say first year to learn your job, second year to master your job, third year to, to take it to that next level and be ready for that promotion or, or that next level. Uh, my pricing person went on to a career at Gallo Wines, uh, with a promotion and Gallo, you know, is a big company and it's very difficult to get into. Another one went into, again, a promotion into, and he's had a, having a great career at Sincient, which is another national company. Um, a third I actually brought with me over to SSI, and I just turned him loose into all the operations and the cost side, and he's been so instrumental in helping us with our work around um, CCNA. Um, and, and then the um, fourth person, um, he has gone on to a very nice career with the uh, local um, irrigation district, the people who do our, our water. Um, so, you know, whether you want to go national or local, but all of them promoted out and all of them are just on the right trajectory. We stay in touch. I give them career guidance every now and then. 
but they all have seemed to figure it out. You know, my pricing person, she actually, not just a Gallo, but then she also got her MBA and then that opened up wow. doors. And, and this girl, you know, she was a first generation um, American. Uh, no one in her family had gone to college before her. The idea of, of, of getting the college degree was a big one of getting the an MBA from UC Davis or their uh, MBA program was a big deal. And she did all of this while having two little ones at home. So it's just the drive and being able to help her capture that and project it. This gal in particular, uh, she'll, she'll be a CEO in no time. I'm confident that she has that, that ability. She's, she's just pulling it all together quickly. Yeah. When you think about all those people that you touch, what what is what does that do inside you, or what how do you how does that affect you? When you think about that, proud mom moments. Um, you know, yeah, I, yeah. I look at my people, and you know, I don't want to say parentally, but but there is a certain amount of parental pride um, as an extension of my family because they're part of my circle, they're part of my my um, my family, my work family. Um, and that brings me great pride in, and that's not to take away from my own daughters. I, I have one daughter who she chose not to go to college, um, but she has slowly been carving her, her course out as a USEF, United States Equestrian Federation, um, pr- professional trainer. And she's teaching these little kids to get on these great big horses and go over fences. And she's been building this, this business on her own with no help from me. Um, and uh, she's doing a great job. I'm just amazed at, at this, that, that entrepreneurship, because I'm, I'm more an yeah. entrepreneur. Within the organization, yeah. I have a lot of yeah, intra- yeah, yeah. entrepreneurial yeah. experience. She's just doing it all entrepreneurially. So it's, it's, that's yeah, very exciting. That's, that's, that, so I, I look at all of these, and so I just cool. proud mom moments. Yeah, it's, 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 it's amazing when you, when you spark something in people and they find that mm-hmm. essence, that is drawn to something and that's encouraged to follow it, then it just grows. That's it goes back to the mm-hmm. comes you said about saying yes to life, you know, saying yes to these opportunities, mm-hmm. you know, going back and yeah. doing the GMAT and going through the calculus and algebra and then moving that forward and just keep on, okay, this makes sense. Let's do this. And 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 when we do that, it it tends to flower. And when we do that for others, it's just so fulfilling, as you said. Uh, yeah. I want to shift the conversation to a couple other areas because you have so much to offer and sh- to share here. Um, you know, in your current role as CFO, you, you indicated that you have implemented finance, FP&A to bring forward transparency and innovation to the finance leadership positions. And how do you approach driving innovation with contained resources? Because that's, you know, sometimes we can get on, you know, innovation steroids. Then other times we, mm-hmm. we would like to innovate more, but we may be constrained in what we can do. Uh, can you share a story or two or just share your philosophy around how innovation gets gets um, forward in an organization like yours? Yeah. You know, it, it comes down to good project management skills, right? And, and when you think about <laughs> yeah. project management, yeah. whether it's writing a paper or planning a career or, or working in an environment, you know, some of the first things you have to do is identify your, your constraints. You're going to uh, understand you know, kind of where you are today and where you need to go and, and where there might be some, some pipeline disruption. Um, and so that you can prioritize your projects around that. And if you're in a constrained environment, you you not only want to be able to prioritize, but you're going to want to look for those high impact projects, you know, the ones that they're the low-hanging fruit. Knock those off as fast as possible because that that's going to build you your street creds, right? Momentum, um, and yeah. then um, yeah. you want to get into uh, leveraging technology wherever you can. And, you know, a lot of times there's a, 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 a conflict or some friction between IT and accounting and finance. And, you know, for me, I, I love technology. So, you know, I recommend know your IT people because when I came into SSI, you know, I had these ideas and I discovered that our IT VP, he actually had a lot of these already kind of queued up. He was just waiting for someone to say, hey, let's just Get turn permission. it on full bore. You know, and mm-hmm. and once we started doing that, it's like it just went from a few low-hanging fruit to a lot of ho- 
low hanging fruit. And then it's chipping away at the rock, right? And then pretty soon there is no big rock to, to do. So leveraging technology um, with those projects. And then finally, fostering the culture of innovation, right? So you want everyone to feel empowered to talk, feel to communicate, right? So be transparent, you know, and be innovative. Um, and, and that then you get that continuous improvement. And so the, I think as I, when I look at my strategies for for that area, those are probably four four key strategies that that I've used. And and you know, again, outcomes easily. You know, it improve, improves your decision making, and you get cost benefits out of it. So, yeah, well said. Does that answer? Thank you. Yeah. And, and and related to technology, AI is changing the playing field in all fields, but few have been affected as much as a finance function, right? And you're mm -hmm. an early adopter, adop, adopter of, of this technology. You, you're very excited about it, as you mentioned earlier in the show. Uh, can you, where do you see it influencing the future of financial management and operations AI? And can you share any specific examples of where, where that you can, where you've integrated AI very successfully in your strategies? Um. Okay, so so if we think about it, you know, Chat GPT really was like a year ago, a year and a half ago when it just kind of started blossoming, it's crazy. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It started becoming a household word, and 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 again, it was kind of the IT folks, right? It was their best kept secret. Um, some of the things that I've done, and and I have, I will never say I'm an expert on it, but I really, if there's a new or or a video out there on LinkedIn Learning that I haven't seen. Um, I really try to hit all of them because there's some, every day it changes and, and it's morphing. It's not just regular. There's no just like generic AI anymore. Right. There's generative and some yeah. of the other ones. So um, how, how I had early adopted it was we changed accounting firms. And in doing so, we needed to provide them with all the SOPs. And in do in doing that, I had made the assumption that of course we you know we've we've had an accounting firm, we have all of our SOPs written, and I discovered very quickly we didn't have SOPs written. Um and and none that were reflective of the current business environment. So um I had to write a lot of SOPs very quickly. So I divvied it up to the team and then I was thinking, okay, this is gonna be really hard and this is gonna be really cumbersome because it takes a while to develop an accounting SOP. Um, I discovered that if I craft my question right into chat, chat GPT, and this is three before they had four um, to add on, um, that it would generate a standard template for me. And then all I had to do was customize it. Well, I ended up knocking, we, we knocked off more than a dozen SOPs within less than two weeks. And this this was in customization and all. So it How was long would just that have an taken overwhelming before field. AI. How long would that have taken before AI? Oh, oh you've written SOPs too, I'm sure. I'm going to say we did that in two weeks, less than two weeks, and that normally would have been probably a three month project, right? Because yeah, exactly the research yeah. and you know, do you have all the controls and and here. You're able, remember AI in the background, it's able to go out and reach into all of those those resources that normally you, if you're writing it, you're going to have to go look up, you know, go out to the AICPA page, you know, do some research on the ICMA page, you know, look at uh, ASB, you know, just go out to all these different s sites, do a lot of research, you know, what can we do? What, how's the policy changed? And chat, things like chat GPT or open AI, um, they can do it in like seconds, right? And, and that's where you get that savings. And then as I look forward to it, you know, we started using OCR technology for invoices. So all the invoices that come in, they get screened um, and it populates this OCR so it can go feed into our system and get processed. Um, you know, and right now we're doing that, but we still have a lot of people who go through that because they don't trust the system or they don't, um, you know, they want to be able to manually go in and, and, and do some changes. And there's still a lot of touching. And I'm thinking what they're doing is tends to be repetitive. If, if it's a craft invoice, it's always the same thing. Calculations they're doing with craft AI. 
that's the beauty of AI is because you can turn it loose and train it. And so it re 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 replicates that. So I could see where that, a that AP function, where I might have, you know, seven or eight people now, you know, once it's fully implemented, I only might need one or two people, the exceptions. Um, I could see where your general ledger accountant, let's start up the food chain, right? Your general ledger account, they're doing your, your general journal entries. Well, how much of those journal entries are just the same journal entry every period, right? You're taking the data and you're reformatting it for the journal entry to move that data into this other system. Well, that's, that's what AI can be trained Perfect. to do, right? You'll have fewer errors, maybe more timely. All of a sudden now you can start to shrink your close process. You're able to reduce some of your errors. And then you really don't necessarily need a GL accountant or an army of GL accountants, but maybe you just need uh, someone more at that accounting manager level to look at the exceptions, right, to deal with that higher skill set. Uh, same thing with uh, financial planning and analysis. And, you know, I look at the tools that are out there, whether it's something like a, a rock hopper, which sits on your Excel and you put in your natural language and it goes out to your, your data lake and pulls the data, you know, or, you know, there, there's a lot of different products out there. Um, you know, data rails is another one, you know, they're, they're able to use this AI to go out there and, and they have different functions and different needs, but they're all beating on it. Of course, it, with AI and its ability to dig down into the organization and grab that data faster and move faster, that, that speed there, it does put the sh shift the challenge now back to IT, not to doing the business analysis so much, that can really shift back to the FP&A, but to making sure that that data lake isn't polluted. Because we, yeah. we all know right. working with data, there's a lot of normalization, a, dot, a lot of data cleansing, a lot of garbage. Mm -hmm. You know, we might have one system that that looks at, at invoices with one date and the other one at another date. And, uh, you know, it's just one might segment to, you know, two decimal places. One might go out to six decimal places. And, and you just got to cleanse the data um, and and have a system where you're just focused on the exceptions. And AI, I think, will just accelerate all of that. And um, I think that'll be really exciting as we move forward. Yeah, it is very exciting. And it's kind of like having a, almost another employee. you got to train it. It does have this amazing ability. And I don't lose it at the level of complication you do. You know, it's just like, I, uh, number one, you have to still be in control of the content and it, the driving of what it's yeah. pulling for you. But over time, it is. It's amazing how it does learn about you and your system and your organization and is able mm -hmm. to then you know, surprise you over time. Like, wow, this is getting really good. It's really exciting. Um, yeah. I, the other area that, that you, that you've been had a lot of involvement is, is mergers and acquisitions, right? You've had your, your resume is full of it. And, you know, this is still an area of how do we actually create a successful merger? You know, you know, in, and I find that it's always a bumpy ride at the beginning of a merger. It's going to be because mm -hmm. it's like bringing a bunch of people together that were doing the things a certain way with another group of people that are doing things a certain way. And there is a natural resistance to changing habits so that we can create new habits in our new organization to move it forward in a way that we want to leverage what this merger was supposed to do for us. What do you think are the most critical factors to consider when a company goes through like a high stakes M&A transition? What, 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 what are the things they have to really be paying attention to most in your mind to make sure it's successful? You, you know, it comes back to um, transparency, authentic, authenticity, and integrity, right? Um, because it is stressful, right? So, so how do we take the noise out of that experience? And again, it's not transparency necessarily throughout the vertical, but, but at that horizontal team that you're working with. Uh, and and building that trust because if you have a team member in that that is going to you know maybe they want to make a name for themselves on this this topic or they're doing something that's going to be just kind of self-centered and divisive it's going to be like a rot it's going to grow and, and it's just going to be too difficult right um and, and part of one of the things i've learned in in my um, career is um, i can be fast to hire which i am but also be fast to fire, right? Because you're not doing anyone a, a service by hanging on to them, right? If it's just, 
<laughs> it's like a relationship. If it's not meant to be, it's not meant to be and move on. Um, and maybe you come back at a different time, right? And I, I've had people that haven't worked out for me in one place, and yet they worked out for me in another. And and that's I'm perfectly fine with that. But it is going to come out to the speed of trust. And uh, we just keep in mind culture trumps strategy. So no matter what, how good your strategy is, if you can't make that culture work, um, yeah, your strategy isn't going to function. And what's what? And because I think it's a culture integration is an area where in which maybe people don't invest as much in why they may fail or may take them longer to succeed. What's the finance function's job in that cultural integration? How, if if you would say that they had a job or a particular focus in the, ensuring that the cultures came together, what what do you see as the value that finance provides in that in that process of integrating the two cultures? Um. It, it, Again, it's getting out of the office and, and talking to people and understanding their processes, mm -hmm. right? Um, and and under, everyone has a role in an M&A of understanding the other side, of, of, of bridging that communication. I mean, we can look at great failures, right, over time. We had Daimler, you know, Benz and Chrysler, right? One was very process and structured, you know, our way, the highway, and you had Chrysler, which was very kind of a innovative approach to business. You know, one was profitable. That's why the other was being bought out um, with Quaker and Snapple. Again, two very different companies. You know, I could look at Pepsi and Sobe. I think actually was a very successful merger. Two very different mm -hmm. cultures, um, but that worked out. Um, you know, finances role, you know, again, it's not just doing due diligence on the numbers. It's doing due diligence on the culture. So kind of like yeah. the pig the pig story it's not just understanding mm -hmm. the numbers but kind of all the stories and perceptions around that so that around you could numbers. bring it all together that 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 was key there um you know making sure that there's some budget allocation for the integration um that it's not all just all work uh, when i i think about that you know i, I don't it's not pizza parties i think we can't eat any more pizza but we can talk about um, some team building activities where people have an opportunity to communicate in a more relaxed environment and, and build those bridges. Um, and then yeah. leadership involvement. You can't just expect uh, the front line to uh, your accountants to do all the, the bridging. The CFO has yeah. to be involved in that. They have to be visible, transparent. And when you do all those things, you end up with a little bit higher morale improved collaboration, smoother transition. So again, it, the the tone is set from the top. Um, the work is really done from the bottom. And again, it's about bridging communication and it's, it's finance can play a big role in that. Yeah, it's beautifully said. Yeah, I mean, it gets back to like that transparency, developing those trust bridges, communicating, being open to hearing concerns, addressing those concerns in whatever way you have to, as people see that happening. You know, telling the story about the new company, making sure people are excited about that, all those kinds of things. Yeah. And then finance has a big role to play in all that. Well, as we wrap up today, you know, one question I like, you know, this is a big question is, you know, what is the future of financial leadership? If there is, if it's, you see it different than it is today, and what's the call to action that you would give to other executives, maybe people that are directors of finance or VPs of finance, aspiring or starting their careers in finance as well as CFOs? I mean, that's a wide range of people may need different things, but, uh, you know, w what would you say to those people that, that are growing in this role of finance that they need to be keeping an eye on the horizon for and developing in their, in their skill set to be successful? Uh, uh, you know, the digital transformation that's going on right now, um, be receptive to it, um, be open to it. You know, I'm not going to say be on the bleeding edge, but but be partner up with your IT um, leadership team to see how how they can help you solve a lot of your problems, and, and then be the champion on that, right? Um, because we we can sit here and say we don't like that technology, and we've seen a lot of ERPs fail because you know someone decided they didn't like it. It's it's not. When I came into to SSI, I had someone who said, you know, they just were not going to do this file bound. And I said, sat them down. And I said, look, it's not your decision. It's my decision. 
we are going to do it. And so how do we get, how do we move past this? What, what can I do to help you with this? Because it's not an option. If you're going to go kicking and screaming or you're going to go, you know, nicely, but we're going to make it happen. You know, and I just had to take a firm stand with that. And it's, um, but it has to happen. It, it, it is going to happen. And, and so as, as leaders, we just sometimes can't abdicate that responsibility. We've got to own it and, and make it happen. Um, you know, having an agile and flexible workforce um, model, um, you know, I hear some, you know, the return to office mandate. It's like, that's a great way if you want to like downsize your workforce, but that the new, the new generation this, this, that's coming up, that's not where we meet them, right? They, they're wanting more flexible. They've seen mom and dad spend you know 80 hours a week at the office and, and miss softball games they they don't want that right they want a little more balance um and so you know how do you make that happen and um you know just be open-minded to to that and, and meet the people where they are and i think if you're meeting the people where they are you're going to have a, a more productive workforce uh, a more connected um, and, and in an odd way, you know, we talked about asynchronous learning and, and creating that connection and that belonging and that um, inclusion, you know, that's that's going to be important. You know, again, you know, we can talk about, I know it's a polarizing topic is DIE, but I think that's important for us in, in the workplace. Um, and then, you, you know, again, using technology for data-driven decision-making, I, I think we need to be very open and invest in that infrastructure, invest in that technology, because that that is going to have the long-term payoff for us. Yeah. Well, I thank, thank you so much, Karen, for everything you shared today, the insights you've given us on financial leadership and transformation and, you know, get to ready people. And the, I, I, so, so much was shared today that I know that executives are going to, you know, resonate with. It's going to add value in their day. Uh, the train is just reinforcing that right now. <laughs> and I'm, I'm sure our listeners gained a lot from the story. So really, thank you very much. Appreciate you being here on the show today. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. yeah. And to all those that are tuning in, I want to thank you for being part of this journey with us. Your time and attention mean the world to me. If you found today's discussion valuable, please spread the world by letting our your colleagues, friends, and anyone who could benefit from this conversation know about Unfazed Under Fire. Remember, you can catch all our, our episodes in video format on YouTube and in audio on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, um, Amazon Music, and over 12 other podcasting platforms. If you're watching on YouTube, you can click, uh, click the uh, links below. and It'll take you to all our shows that we've ever produced if you're interested in, and this is your first program and you're interested in listening to others. And until next time, I want to keep, keep leading with purpose and making an impact as a leader. Have a great rest of your day. And we'll see you next time. This is David Craigotts, Leadership Alchemist, signing off for today.